Um, these events don't happen by themselves. We especially want to thank uh, Eisenhower, especially Brett Klein, for all that he's done. He's an exciting new model. And also to uh, a group of wonderful volunteers. You've seen them uh, throughout the day being uh, you know, moderators and helping uh, ushers and things like that. So, um, and Chris has done a great job of organizing it. So thank, thanks all to them as well. And to all of you for being here. So, um, Greg has already kind of introduced Mark early in the day, built him up, and now You're he's doing a nice, really nice one for him. <laughs> <laughs> you did, I can't tell what you've done. Go no, no slouch, come on. Okay. <laughs> well, Mark is, is a presence of the community. Um, I had to find this uh, uh, speech, but um, anyone who's, who's seen him or met him, he's, he's an amazing presence. He's an amazing life story, which you're about to hear. But he does so much for the community, and uh, he's a real example of resiliency and long-term survivors. And I don't think I need to say more because he's about to say it all. So, Mark, without further ado. Yeah! Hello. You know, I am so looking forward to this. I have. I, I've been rude. I've been like just, just like a, a, a racehorse wanting to get out of the gate all day long. But I've been going to the workshop sessions as well, you know, because uh, I wanted to talk about sex, and, um, and I did. So uh, I, I have a blog, it's called My Fabulous Disease, that's kind of my outlet, that's my voice, that's my creative outlet, that's the way that I, it's my primal scream, it's the way that I can talk about issues, and I can highlight the work of other people and other things that interest me, and so that's, that's I'm a writer, I'm a writer. Um, basically, that's, that's the, my primary thing. I like to say I'm a gay, HIV-positive addict in recovery. What's not to love? That's what my mother would say. Um, and, and actually, this is kind of a momentous uh, weekend for me, because yesterday was March 15th, and on March 15th, 1985, I tested HIV-positive. It was 34 years and one day ago. And uh, I was probably infected in 1981 during my summer of love in Los Angeles, but saying that just seemed like showing off. So I'm just going to say <laughs> it was 1985 and it's been 34 years. And the reason, I, I agree so much with what Greg said at the beginning of the day about, I know you, I know you, you know me. I mean, it's, and Michael Callens once said, you know, there's nothing more um, remarkable and special than a group of people living with HIV in the same room comparing stories and talking. And it, it goes even more so for long-term survivors. And uh, so I, I know who you are, and I have a feeling that there's some things that you experience that I have as well. Uh, for instance, I got a new provider recently. Um, his name is Sebastian, he's German, he's got a German accent, he's very attractive, but very young. And, I, and like the first time I sat down to meet with him, I said, how, how, how old are you? I just felt rude, but I asked him anyway. And he said, I'm, I'm 32. And I said, I have HIV antibodies older than you are. <laughs> and, 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 and then I started to think, and I'm like, you know, wait a second, my HIV antibodies are old enough to have grown up and gone to college and gone to medical school and then specialized in HIV and now be serving people. <laughs> So that's how old my antibodies are, and um, God love them. And, and I know I don't look like it's been 34. I'm, I'm 58 years old, and I know I don't look like it. Um, and that's because I've had a lot of work done, and, and I mean that most sincerely. You know, I, I had a lot of facial wasting and all of that, and. Um, I always say if I'm lost at sea, my uh, facial fillers will serve as a flotation device, you know, because I want to make sure uh, that I, I, you know, there's something, you know, I, I kept thinking, is it vanity or is it what? And as my doctor, Dr. Perone in South Florida, who's really good at this, I said, don't make me look like a real housewife. I just want to look like this never happened, you know, and uh, which I think is fair. And, um, and, and, and that's what he did. Um, and, and then, do you also get the feeling, I don't know, like on World AIDS Day, have any of you ever had <laughs> the feeling, this is terrible, for all of our allies and younger people with HIV, I love you all, but have you ever had the feeling of long-term survivors sitting at World AIDS Day and feeling like a professional drag queen having to contend with Halloween? 
<laughs> you know, like you're like you're on RuPaul's Drag Race and it's Halloween, and you're like, who are you people? You know, where were you? You're all RuPaul's Drag Race superstars, as as far as I'm concerned. So that is some of the things I think we have in common, even if I'm a little snarky about it. And um, here's some things I want to say. I want to start right here. Two weeks ago, Jim Shud died. And I knew Jim because he was uh, an active presence. He was a long-term survivor, but not a long-term survivor, a super long survivor. He was uh, verified as having had HIV for 40 years. His doc his, he lived in Los Angeles. His doctor happened to be Michael Gottlieb. Michael Gottlieb, the doctor who reported the first cases. Remember the New York Times story that said, LA doctor is finding these strange cases of pneumonia and all of these things among gay men? Jim was one of those men he was talking about. Jim lived and lived and lived and advocated and talked about disabilities and talked about those of us living with HIV and why we needed to respect it and what the Denver principles were and all of that stuff. And then when he had a stroke and he had to be in a wheelchair, well, I saw him at conferences in a wheelchair and there he was. And, uh, and I knew him through Facebook. It was kind of those, one of those Facebook things. But I saw him at conferences and kind of took kindest in man you ever want to know. He got, okay, he got his own death. And by that I mean he got an article in the paper and it wasn't on an obituary page crowded with 50 other ones. He got his own death. It was singular. This man knew that, that meant so much to so many people got his own obituary in the Los Angeles Blade all by himself. And there's something triumphant to me about that because um, he didn't die back when it was all the rage and everybody was doing it, you know? When there were so many of us, we could not grieve properly for anybody individually. They were just coming so fast, right? So, so I, I think so much of our trauma, so much of what goes on is the fact that sometimes on a particular Sunday, while we're sitting at home, a particular song comes on and it's like, oh, him, right? He died, and, I, and, and, and suddenly the tears come or something, because now you finally get a second to catch up, to catch up on the grief. And so if there's anything I can say about Jim other than the mighty, mighty contributions that he uh, contributed to us as a community and to long term survivors, it's that he got his own goddamn obituary all by himself. And I think that's fantastic. Um, so. In Jonathan. So, here's a little bit about my story, and I've decided that there's nothing I can say to you that you don't already know. That you are empowered because you, that's what you, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You've been going to the breakout sessions and all of that. So, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to tell you stories. I'm going to tell you my favorite stories, and maybe along the way there will be some insight and some ahas and some time for you to go, oh yeah, me too. And that's all we need. That's all we need today. So, it's 1980, and I'm going to Los Angeles, visiting Los Angeles with my boyfriend, and we take a tour of CBS Studios. And as part of the tour, we see that there's a line forming to, to watch The Price is Right. And, um, and so we get in line, and people come talk to me, and we go sit in the studio, and then this happens. <laughs> Yeah, whipping around. 
around New Orleans than that. You'd be you have a girlfriend back there at the University of New Orleans. Oh, yeah. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had several girlfriends. sitting there with these girls behind him and she, they're like, oh my god, he went the car, I'm gonna take him. And he turns around and says, no way, honey, he's mine. <laughs> and so, I mean, this is 1980. It's not like when gays were all over the TV, okay, you know, and we're wearing matching outfits and all that. My father taped this from a Betamax machine that had just been invented off the TV. And it's a good thing because Goodman Johnson, who makes the show, they had a fire in their warehouse and this tape does not exist anymore. And so I got the only one. And so here I am and I, there's something about, I don't know, I, I, you know it's fun to show all this, this and stuff, but it's also, I, ha I have to look at that adorable young man and I look at it as before, just before. And if you put yourself back in just before, you know, here I am on vacation, I've got a handsome boyfriend, I've got my life ahead of me, and I'm winning the prices right. I mean, so much promise, so much, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to go to college. And, well, why is it that I never got that master's in arts management? Well, some shit happened. That's why, you know? And just I look at that and I think, God, right before, right before. So I went to Los Angeles, and I didn't laugh, and I, um, go ahead, uh, that's my grand. So I go to Los Angeles and move there the next year, and I become a television actor. I, I, I do television commercials. Can you tell I'm theatrical? And um, I did, I, I wasn't an actor like I took classes. I would just show up at commercial auditions and I'd go, him because I had red hair and a freckled face and I could be in a McDonald's commercial. And so again, it was just, this was the life, you know? There was something that I kind of heard about and it was out there. It was something out there, or it was, uh, it was in New York, or it was skies and they were super sleazy. That's what I thought, something out there. And uh, meanwhile, oh, this is one of the, I know, I did every fast food there was. Here's McDonald's, and my, my, my line was, it's McDonald's fabulous rodeo to riches. <laughs> and the director had to keep saying, please put a little less emphasis on the word fabulous. <laughs> it's McDonald's fabulous rodeo to riches. <laughs> so that took some work, but I'm a professional. I figured it out. That's what life was. And then it, and then, uh, and then it started, and then it started to happen, and then it got a little, cre it creeped a little closer, right? It crept a little closer enough, enough that I used to have those stop aids meetings in my apartment. Those stop aids was like very early on, and they would just sit around, and an educator would talk about how they think you might get it, or how they think you might not get it. Would you give us some money, please? And that's, and I did it. It was like charity work. Charity, sure, I'll do that, you know, while I'm making some bucks, you know, doing McDonald's commercials or whatever. But then, I read, well, about this time, it was 1981 or 1982, and Charlie, the handsome guy you saw, he and I were at the New York Company Bar and Grill, which was a gay restaurant where they, it was nice, they had like candles on the table and real tablecloths, and we went there for our anniversary. It was our anniversary, we had been together for a few years. And we're sitting having tape, and we're sitting having, uh, here comes the Rock Hudson story. So, I feel like uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy Griffin, you know, gossiping about something, but it's true. So, we were having our dinner, and behind me, Charlie keeps staring, right? Charlie, looking over my shoulder, going, I'm like, what's going on? He says, Rock Hudson is sitting in the tomb over there, right behind you. And I'm like, well, stop staring at him, that's rude. Don't, don't look at celebrities, you're not supposed to do that. You know, basically I'm just jealous because he has a perfect view and I can't really do that to look at the guy. And then I hear this voice and he says, y'all doing okay over there? <laughs> and I look at his rock and like, rock I'm talking to him. And, and, and Charlie, who's this middle boy Texan big hearted guy, says, oh yeah, we're doing fine, how are you doing? And he says, well, and, and Rock says, Mr. Hudson, Rock says, 
Um, well, my friend and I were just discussing it, and we thought that maybe y'all were having a fight over there. And I'm like, Rock Hudson's discussing me, Rock Hudson's discussing me. You know? And uh, Charles says, oh no, we're at our, what's our anniversary? We're having a, he says, your anniversary? Well, congratulations. Why don't you come over here and sit down at our table and have a drink? And I'm like, no, Charles, I don't even do that. He's like, getting up, and he's walking over there to sit down. And so I get the, I get the seat next to Rock, because I would tear off Charlie's arm if he tried to sit there. So I sit at that seat, and we're sitting there, and the drinks are coming. He was, he was an accomplished drinker, I'll put it that way, an accomplished drinker. And, he's, and we're having a good time, and we're talking, and the game Trivial Pursuit had just come out. It was like, it was, you know, Trivial Pursuit was, hadn't been out for very long. And we start talking about Trivial Pursuit. And Rock says, I've never played it. And Charlie says, well, you should come over sometime and play. And Rock says, I'd love to. And Charlie says, how about tonight? And Rock <laughs> says, sure. Uh -huh. and, and they decide, Charlie and Rock, that this friend that Rock came with, was some friend, that Charlie would drive him home. And I would go with Rock to our house, which was a crappy little walk up one bedroom apartment in West Los Angeles. And he's driving the nice car. So I get in the car with Rock, drive to my house. And we get go upstairs. And Charlie arrives not soon thereafter, and I've got a bottle of scotch. He drinks the whole thing. I start rolling a joint, and Rock says, don't. Uh, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, smoke. It'll make me really horny. And I am rolling a joint faster than you can start fucking. <laughs> we play the whole game. There was a Doris Day question. He won the game of Trivial Pursuit. Charlie had kind of gone to bed. And uh, we stay up and yada, yada, yada. He is uh, in my shower about an hour later. Um, and um, there has been a lot of talk about whether or not Rock Hudson is well hung. I'm just going to say. There has been. And I would never, ever, say anything about a, a, a fallen stars of the length because I don't think that is, I think it would be rude, really. I think it would be rude to even tell you because it just, I don't think it would make any sense. It would be um, uh, disrespectful to his memory, really, you know. Um, I do remember the end of the sex and sitting on him and looking at him having the fireworks that just happened on my end and he's staring up at me in the dark and I can see his eyes and he says, are you done? And it just, it's like in that split second I'm like, what have I, what have I done? What did I just do? And why did I do that? And it's my anniversary and who's sleeping in the, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not all like, great choices, okay? Um, and uh, so he's in the shower, and because he has to get home to somebody, Mark Christian, as it turns out, who would later sue the estate. And, uh, um, and as he's leaving, I seriously swear to God, say, before you go, can I get your autograph? Aww. And he scribbles all my best rock and on a piece of paper, he's gone, and, and that was that. That's the story. Um, but then in 1985, in March, that's, that's when I tested that. That was taken the year that, that uh, I took the test. And suddenly it was bang, bang, bang. Bang, bang, bang. Suddenly it was very close. Suddenly I'm testing positive. Friends I know are, are getting sick. And, um, and uh, my countdown begins, right? Um, around 1986, 1987, we, we used to take these trips. I remember this. We would go to Tijuana this group of us, and it would be me, and Ron, and Mark Zavala, and Leslie. And the four of us would go to Tijuana because there, and I can't remember the drug, I'm not sure if it was AZT. AZT was approved in 87. It could have been available in Mexico just before. I'm not sure it was AZT, it was one of those drugs. We'd go to Tijuana and make a weekend out of it, or overnight. We go to Tijuana and we all go to every pharmacy that we can get separately. We all go so we can get as much of the drug as we can. And we literally fill up the trunk of this drug that our friends back at home can't get. 
and we fill up the trunk with it, and then we spend the night, we rent a house, you know, on the beach in Tijuana for like nothing, and stay up late, and I remember Leslie hated Mark Zavala, hated him, but then after a few drinks, he didn't hate him as much, and they started having sex so loud that it kept the rest of us away. I remember <laughs> that, and spending that night in Tijuana, and, um, and doing this so that we could go home and like the Grinch at the end of the Grinch Stroll Christmas, take all, of the, take all the drugs we got and make, give them out to all of our friends who, who could not get them. That's what we did. We were the posse that did that for our circle of friends. Um, and I remember coming back from that trip and we had, were driving through San Diego and it was Sunday and it was tea dance at the West Coast Production Company. <laughs> And it's West Coast Production Company, and it's almost on the dance floor. And it is like celebration, jubilation. We got all these AIDS drugs in the trunk of the car. You know, they're, they're filling up the trunk of the car. And um, we don't care. We're not thinking about that. We're thinking about this song, for this exact song was playing that afternoon at the thing. And I remember the four of us, and we are in a circle. You know how you had real good friends on the dance floor, and you'd be dancing, and you'd have your arms around each other, and you'd be doing this? You remember that? You remember how much fun that was? And we were a tribe, and we didn't fucking care, and it was willful life. It was willful living that whatever was going on outside that dance floor, fuck that right now. Fuck the drugs that are in the trunk of the car and why we're doing that. Fuck all that. Dance. Dance. Ugh. So, <clears throat> Leslie died two years later in my guest room. Ron died three years later in a nursing home because his parents didn't know what to do with him. They couldn't handle it. And I'm sorry, I earned this. This is okay. We all get to do this. We earned this. I didn't do this enough then. I didn't do this enough then. So I, this is the gift that Greg tells us about. This is a gift to be able to do this now. Mark Zavala died about the time it's less than. If you had a guest room, somebody was dying in it. Certainly true for mine. This is the sad part because I have to say it. I'm a load of laughs, but I have to tell you this too. Oh, did I tell you about the time that I owned a gay phone sex service? <laughs> While I was being an actor, I didn't have time. I, I, I didn't have regular jobs, so I heard this phone sex company, old kind, credit card, $42. You're, you call up this 800 number and order the kind of guy you want to talk to, and for $42, a guy very similar to the guy you ordered calls you back. Well, I figured they must use actors for this, and I was right. I called them up and said, I'm an actor, I think I could do this. They said, do you like phone sex? I said, no, not really. They said, perfect, because we don't want people. So, <laughs> turns out, I had a knack for it. I had a knack for it, way with words. And I could be, you know, the young surfer dude, or I could be the leather uh, daddy and all of that. I had to read Drummer Magazine for research. And so I had to do all this, and I got really good at it. Pretty soon people were requesting me. I had a Rolodex file of, 5,000 customers. I had, I had men paying $42.50 to speak to me three times a week for years. I opened my own company, called it Telerotic. Please note that I was good at copywriting even then. Our men know you like the palm of your hand. <laughs> so, it was fascinating because I was speaking to a couple of dozens of guys a day because I wanted to do the calls rather than pay other people when I opened my own company. And I learned so much about the, the gay male mind and how it thinks when money is on the line and it's intimate and it's just a voice on the phone and the things you will blurt out that you want. 
And it was fascinating from a purely anthropological standpoint. It really was. It really was. I learned what men want, and are you ready? Okay, here it is. Men want to be taken care of. Don't we all? That ultimately, everybody just wanted to be taken care of. And that it didn't matter what they were in real life, if they were top, if they were bottom, or whatever. Everybody wanted somebody bigger and stronger and well, better hung than they were. Very few guys asked for a bottom. <laughs> Very few. It was, I want somebody bigger and stronger who will, at the end of the day, take care of me. You know? Um, those lessons really came in handy years later when I would design HIV prevention programs for gay men and learn how to speak uh, in words they would understand. So really, so, so it was all for the good of the community, folks. That's the next time I saw Rob on that show with Doris, standing next to Doris Day, and all of us going, oh shit. He is the first person that I ever had sex with that I knew died of AIDS. And I don't want to make my tragedy any worse, any greater than anybody else's. We all went through this. It didn't matter if that guy was on the 11 o'clock news, 6 o'clock news every day. We were seeing ourselves. He was a stand-in for that other person, that person we know that is now sick, um, that you know you had sex with. And yes, people say to me sometimes, well, do you think that you're, um, uh, do you think uh, uh, that uh, you're carrying Rock Hudson's HIV baby? <laughs> I said, honey, no. <laughs> there were so many. This is a very crowded field, especially that summer. Trust me, this is when I was a, a bottom, honey. Mike Glover's here. This is my husband. This is when I was a bottom. <laughs> Close your ears. I'm a top man. Close your ears. I've been a top, how long have we been together? Eight years? I've been a top for eight years. And loved it. So, so I had to, I had to watch that. We all had to watch that. Rock Hudson getting an experimental treatment. What, Rock Hudson on the tarmac, remember the views of him taking out of a, of a plane in Paris and the wind's blowing and there is the poor body trying to get treatment in Paris. My dad calls me. He says, hey, you know him. Didn't y'all tri tri play Trivial Pursuit? I told my parents that part. <laughs> Just that part. And so my dad calls up and says, why don't you go down to the hospital and bring him for tri Trivial Pursuit? You know, the, you're cheering up. I'm like, oh, dad. <laughs> it was a lot more trivial than you had. So that didn't happen. Um, but he was our stand-in for that guy we knew. And I'm for what happened to him. So that's the rest of my Rock Hudson story. This is Daniel Warner, and uh, he uh, founded Los Angeles Shanti, not to be confused with Shanti San Francisco, separate organization we were founded to help people die. So when I tested positive and all this shit came down, I said, okay, I'm gonna go work for somebody until I die. I'll make some points with the people upstairs and just work until I die, because that's what we do, right? That's why we've all, all worked so hard today, by the way baked into our DNA. We came that way. We worked until we died, because then we died, right? He was executive director when I had my interview to be his assistant. Who could say no? Hello. He was absolutely beautiful, Daniel Warner, member of the leather community, by the way, Kingster, wherever you are, there you are. Member of the leather community and just a dear, dear man. And I'm just staring at him during my interview going, please hire me, please hire me, please hire me. You know, because I wanted this job. I wanted this this penance to be paid, right? And, um, and he hired me and it was terrific and we helped people die with dignity. We trained volunteers to be with them because there were no meds, there was nothing to be done. It was just us as a volunteer being a non-judgmental, compassionate presence for them. Daniel worked for a few years. He was not feeling well, he wasn't doing very well. He was our founding executive director. He went home to San Francisco. Didn't see him again until we had our first big star-studded uh, fundraiser for Shanti a couple of years later. And here was Daniel there. And let me tell you something. That's Miss America, that's Leonza Cornett, the first Miss America to win on an HIV platform. She was his escort. 
as the founding executive director of, and I was the media guy, and I ran the room, the media room with all the cameras, with entertainment, because Bette Midler was there, and, and all sorts of big stars were performing. And so we had a media room with a line of cameras and stuff, and all the cameras, and entertainment, and I, and NBC, and all these people had their cameras ready, and I would bring the stars in, and they would walk along and do little interviews, you know, like you see at the Oscars, right? So I go backstage, and this walks around the corner. And I haven't seen him since. And I'm like, oh my God, Daniel, it's so wonderful to see you. And he is smiling. He's got this enormous smile. And he says, have you met my date? Have you met my date? And, and they're ready to go into the room together. And I'm like, sure. And I'm trying to process this. And I walk into the media room and I say, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. America Leonza Kernet and uh, Daniel Warner, founding member of Bowie Shunt. And they walk in, and the cameras start, the flashes start, there's hundreds of them, so it's like, fuh, 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 and then they just kind of stop. And it's like the photographers, it's like they couldn't understand what they were looking at. And they stopped, and they looked around their cameras to see, am I seeing this right? Is there something wrong? And Lianza just holds Daniel's arm, arm even tighter and smiles bigger and they keep stepping into the room and Daniel smiles and all of a sudden the cameras start again and the flashes start again and it's flashing and flashing and flashing and flashing and suddenly they are stars and they're like, Mr. Warner, this way, this way, please look this way, Ms. Ms. Cornette, this way, this way, this way. And he's the biggest star in the fucking world. The bravest, biggest star in the world in that moment. So Liz, here's my Liz Taylor story. So remember when Magic Johnson came out about being HIV positive? Is this too gossipy, Matt? Or Matt doing okay? When, when Magic Johnson came out, what a gift that was, right? To finally have someone who wasn't a white gay man, let's face it, somebody who could speak to a broader community about what's going on. So Magic Johnson comes out and he retires from, the, from, the, from basketball. I'm now director of uh, media, uh, public relations for Shanti. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm learning as I go along. You know, we all were. And I'm, I, we're gossiping with the other agencies. We're talking to, I'm talking to APLA, I'm talking to the other agencies. And, I, and we're all saying, well, what will Magic Johnson do? Will he start his own foundation? Will he go work for somebody else? Who's gonna get him at their next event, right? I mean, this was valuable stuff. And uh, somebody told me that Liz Taylor had sent him flowers. And we're like, oh, well, that, that, that's it. Elizabeth Taylor has Aid Foundation. She's obviously, she's courting him, and she's sent him flowers. Not that she could have sent them out of the goodness of her heart, right? You know? And so I'm, we're just gossiping and all that. And so I get a call from a reporter. And he's saying, what is the impact of Magic Johnson, you know, having come out about this? You know? And what do you think will happen to, to AIDS and fundraising? And I said, well, I hear Liz Taylor is courting him like crazy. She sent him flowers and everything. <laughs> like he's just some guy, and, and, and the guy's like, oh, really, really, really. This next page, the Los Angeles Times, front page, Magic Johnson's in back in the HIV arena. I hear Liz Taylor's courting him like crazy, said Mark King of the Los Angeles Times Foundation. She sent him flowers and everything. <laughs> well, the paper comes out first thing in the morning. I'm in the office, it's 10 a.m., and my boss comes in. Sue, she's great. She comes in and she says, Mark, um, I just got a call from Elizabeth Taylor's people. I said, really? And she says, yes. And I am quoting here. They said, the man said to me, Elizabeth would like to know who the fuck is Mark King. <laughs> and I'm like, Elizabeth Taylor hates me. <laughs> Okay, that's my brush with Elizabeth Taylor. It's the closest I ever got. However, her granddaughters are only two of the several grandchildren who are working very hard on HIV issues that have really taken up the mantle, and that have they not? And uh, that includes the two Wilding sisters here, uh, including Layla, who's on the left. Doesn't she look like Liz? Oh my God, you should see her in person. You should hear her talk. She talks like this, she talks just like Liz. And they have shown up. They have shown up at international AIDS conferences. They have shown up at the criminalization conferences where they're really taking a, a special interest in HIV criminalization. And so I was talking to I, I was talking to her at a cocktail thing at a criminalization conference, and Edwin Bernard walks up to her and says, Oh, have you read Mark's book? You know he had sex with Rock Hudson? 
this is my introduction to Layla Wiley. You had sex with Rock Hudson? And she looks at me and she says, really? Well, we're practically related. <laughs> That's my brother on the left. I have a gay brother. His name is Dick. I have a gay brother, and his name is Dick King. <laughs> and uh, that is his long-term uh, partner, Emil. Emil was diagnosed with AIDS in the early years when all of this was happening. So while those other friends were dying, they were going through it themselves. Um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Dick helped Emil. Dick helped Emil die. Um, it was a pact they had made one for the other. That when things got too bad, they had the plan. When they had the second halls stowed away, they knew how they were going to do it. And, uh, and Dick was there and, you know, stirred the glass, right? You know, something that he wasn't even able to speak about for a, a long time, talking to me about, but something extremely common for those of us. And we know what that's like, and I want to name it because I think a lot of it was done with a great amount of love. So, the big questions that we had during this time that suddenly got shoved, it's kind of like, you know, you think you have your whole life to figure out things. Why are we here? Why are we here? What's it all about, Alfie? Who is God? Just stuff, big stuff. You figure you got all the, you got some time. And suddenly something happens like this, what we went through, and you don't have time. And you're like, how, what are the answers to those questions? How do I get answers to those questions? What does it all mean? Um, who is God? And who's gonna, who, who, do I want a rabbi in my service? Do I want it to be metaphysical? Is it gonna what? That's why people like Louise Hay and others were, so, were, were welcomed with open arms because at least they were bringing us something, a spirituality that felt safe. Um, I've always said uh, that uh, a guy searching for spirituality is like a fish in the water searching for... Oh, I fucked that one up. <laughs> a fish in the ocean searching for water. That's spirituality. We're, we're covered in it. Um, but we still had those questions, and it's something that just racked me, and I just had to throw it on there. And then 1996 happens, of course, and the new drugs come along, and um, I have spent the last, you know, however long, 10 years preparing to die. I have, phys I have, phys I have emotionally come to terms with that. I have run up the credit card. I've sold the life insurance policy. I took a trip around the world. I told my boss to go to hell, and now I'm going to live. You know, and, and, then I, and then I feel guilty because I don't feel grateful. I just feel frustrated, you know. Um, do you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had to go through a lot of readjustment. And some of that readjustment had to do with, oh, I'm going to live now. Well, then I want, the, I want the goddamn gay life that I was promised that I expected when I was 24 years old and tested positive. It was almost as if I reverted back to being 24 again. And when I want a trainer, I want steroids, a lot of steroids. I want uh, to be dancing on boxes shirtless. Because that's, I'm reclaiming, claiming my life and my sexuality. That's it. That's what I want. That's what I thought I had missed. It had nothing to do with what I needed as a 36 year old man, right? So instead, I'm dancing shirtless on boxes, having a lot of sex and drugs, and dance floor drugs, and then crystal meth, and then less dancing and more meth, and then less anything else, and shooting up meth every day. And um, that's grief. That's trauma. That's, bless you. Um, and yet, we still have, you know, we just love to um, separate ourselves from the other, right? Whoever the other is. Gay men are remarkably good at it, um, but we all do it, right? And so, even within our culture of HIV, 
they're, they're well, there's the HIV negative, there's the HIV positive, there are those who are positive but are on treatment and doing well. There are those positive that, that, that are old time, long time survivors and you know, they have facial wasting. They have physical, they have physical manifestations of the disease. And so there, there's a hierarchy of who looks like what, who's sipping coffee in cafe, cafe disabilité, you know, as I call the Starbucks, you know, who is, uh, I guess what I'm saying is, we don't have any problem stigmatizing ourselves as much as, because we learned how to do that from everybody out there. I just think that sometimes we do it even within our own community. Let us not forget that, um, oh, we'll get there. Let's not forget that um, uh, an estimated 40% of people living with HIV in this country are, are detectable. Not undetectable. I love me some undetectable. I love me some U equals U. I like to make sure that we allow for the fact that treatment and HIV is a journey. And none of us started out undetectable. And let's be careful about how we use that language. Um, and if I'm gonna live, suddenly I have to deal with growing older as we've, as we've all talked a lot about today, right? This is a video I did 10 years ago. It's a little piece of it where I was kind of bemoaning uh, pushing 50, God forbid, um, and, and uh, this is what... This is a little gay bar bag that's popular in my gay community here in Atlanta. And uh, here's a description of a little neighborhood bar that I love. Serves the full spectrum of our community, uh, all types, ages 20s through 40s. Okay, okay. I see where you're going. Everyone goes here. Everyone is in their 20s through 40s. And if you are not everyone, I guess you are no one. I do not exist. Um, exist. No, existence is you, know, you exist way too much sometimes. <laughs> this is a societal fixation that is not limited to gay men, so you're just going to have to get over it. I mean, young girls are, are pressured to be sexual and thin at a very young age, and we're seeing, we're being blasted with images that are just not normal people. So don't get sucked in, whether I like it or not, this has an effect on me. But you've lived to see all of this. I get it. But now, now having not been killed off by AIDS, I've reached the baseline of other concerns shared by other gay men, and it's got its own set of perils. Oh, 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 and, and now there are studies suggesting that people with HIV, men with HIV, age faster than normal. You know, something about bone density or heart disease or something, I don't know, something like that. Let's talk about some things that uh, actually have an effect on us today that are real. Um, that uh, based on taking medications for so long, for instance, fat distribution, lipodystrophy, you know, I have wanted sitting to be more comfortable for myself, so I will let you know that right now I am sitting down uh, using some sit relief shorts um, from Lipoware. What? Sit relief shorts. Padded butt panties? You are wearing padded butt panties right now, you are not. Yes. And they are making my sitting more comfortable. Shut up! Oh my god, let me see your ass. <laughs> this is not about appearances, Mark. It is about comfort. And let me see your ass! Turn around! Get this on camera. All right, fine. All right. I'm, I'm going to do this because no one should be embarrassed about this problem. <gasps> Woohoo! That's right, baby! You got some junk in your trunk! <laughs> Again, the goal here is comfort. That's a good ass. I mean, you should be like a pole dancer or something. This is just not helpful. Of course, I don't know if it looks as good as this, because these are padded butt shorts that are from Butt For You. It's another company that produces shorts for people with wasting. Oh my god. Who knew that we had such nice butts, huh? We never have, and you know it. Well, don't tell that to the people at the grocery store because I'm like buying everything that's on the bottom shelf, you know, like bending the whole not being ridiculous. I mean, really, does it come down to that again? You know, just strutting around, looking to be laid or well, sued? Yes. Take all your experiences and youth and boyish charms and pack them all up and march into your 50s. 
Don't look back. Look to see what's next. I get it. I get it. All right, okay. But you I have to go. I always say all of my writing is a memory piece because it's only memory that we have. It's all in relation to the past. It's all looking back. It's all so, you know, in retrospect. It's all retro. Life is retrospect. And I look at that now and say, what the hell was I whining about? I'm adorable. I look great there. You know, it was, you know. You know, and 10 years from now, we'll see pictures of all of us here going, wow, that looked great. I love my hair then. You know, whatever it is, right? Uh, and I will always think about the undetectable thing is that I, I, I love this. I just want to be careful that we're not uh, creating a new viral underclass. That it's, one, it's another thing that we have to, you know, this is a journey for all of us, right? And uh, let's be kind to one another. Um, and so what did I learn? I think one of the things I learned, I'll tell you what I learned about God, and that's this. I thought when Leslie died, I would see something. He was my first friend to die. I thought there'd be curtains rustling, something would happen, there'd be a specter, who knows what. I kept waiting. We were all sitting around his bed when he took his last breath. I thought, well, this is the time. We're going to get to see something good here. You know, come on, let's go. You know, and nothing. Just, just absolutely nothing. Just It was explained to me by somebody smarter than I am not too long after that, that if you're looking for God, just quit looking at the drapes, man. You know, look in that room. Look to see who was there. Look to see what we were doing for one another. Having the intimacy of death, which is its own kind of miracle. Especially when you're surrounded by people that love you and chose to be there with you. That's God. That's all I need to know about that. Um, what else uh, have I learned? Well, um, the meaning of life is this. Just grab your knitting, grab, get your needlepoint. That about which we are most ashamed or have the most challenge is the very thing, if we are able to speak of it, that can help somebody else. It's as simple as that. The very thing that embarrasses us most, that gives us the most challenge. I'm a drug addict in recovery, I'm a gay man, I'm living with HIV. Not everybody can do that, but when they can, even in the smallest little way, one person at a time, it's, it's the, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why I think we're here. And there is trauma. There's the trauma of a lot of what I've discussed. There's the trauma of how I ended up uh, 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 addicted to drugs and acting out in that way. There is vicarious trauma. There are those of you who are care providers who have had to give a whole lot of HIV test results that were positive. You absorb that. We absorb that and we are changed. Our, we are changed. Our brain is changed. Vicarious trauma. So, I, I don't have a lot of patience for people who say only those of us who are positive or living with AIDS can understand, truly understand. My heart is open in the 35 years I've had this to include, to get bigger, to say my brother who is negative knows what it's like to live with AIDS. There is also those providers and allies of ours who have been absorbing this stuff and having to stand strong and be the strong ones for us, right? That sometimes takes even more courage. So, there is trauma here. There's love here. This is a picture of me proposing to Michael on Christmas Eve um, four years ago, five years ago. Huh? What? 2014. Thank you. Um, and that's Michael right there. And um, over 50, over 50, you get your shit together and figure out who your authentic self is after going, going through the meat grinder we went through? I don't deserve that. Or do I? You know, it's kind of like, why am I doing this work? Did I, am I doing it for survival? Am I doing it for the glory? Am I doing it for forgiveness? 
Do I need forgiveness to be here? Do I need forgiveness to be alive? Do I need the forgiveness of Leslie and Ron and Mark and Emil for being alive and not leading the life that I promised them I would? I promised them. I learned about caregiving. There's me and my dad, I love my dad. And when he was dying of cancer, my family had never experienced a death before, you know, in recent times. They didn't know what the hell to do. I was the one that saying to my mom, you need to get a hospice care in here. Honey, get it. Oh, oh no, I, I can do it. No, you can't, Mom. You're, you're hardly sleeping. You can't pick him up and help him to the bathroom. You need hospice care. We need this, 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 this. How did I know that when I was 30-something when my dad died? Well, we know. We know how to do that. We know our way around that stuff. And I was able to provide that for my family in a way that was, you know, I had, I had my shit together. And they, they really appreciated it. It came very, uh, it was, uh, came in handy. My dad. Oh, I told you the secret of life. Damn it. Um, and finally this, this is kind of some, sometimes the hardest thing to say. We are not unique. And this is what I mean by that. Our tragedy feels singular because it was so dramatic. It has been so dramatic. And let's face it, we were faced with an illness and a virus that was splashed on the front page of the paper every day. And the whole world was experiencing it. There was all this there's all this stir and drang, and there was the politicians and the yes, it was quite dramatic, quite dramatic. There is tragedy all over the place, and what I have learned, uh, I believe that it gives me comfort, and this is comforting to me, is the fact that I am not unique in my great tragedy, and in fact, if I can use my great tragedy as a way of creating empathy for other people. If, if I don't do that, what the hell is all this for? What was this all this for if I can't use all of this and say, tell me more. Tell me more about that. That happened to you. I don't have to look, you know, to give you a shopping list of what that means, of what people go through, of what there are people sitting here in this audience right now who have been through some shit. Growing up, other things, tragedies, accidents, deaths. It's gone through some stuff that I have never gone through. And so if I can just use what I've got to help me listen and realize, to me, we've, I've been very introspective throughout AIDS, through most of my journey. What does this mean to me? Oh my gosh, what is God? Why is this happening to me and to us and all of that and these people that are so mean to us and they're giving us such shit? That's all true, but at what point do I have the power to take that and put it out like this and say, make me a human being that does this and say, now how can I use this to help understand somebody else and help somebody else? We are not unique. There's a lot of shit. Um, here's my book. It's called A Place Like This. You kind of heard the best parts, but if you want to read it, you can get it on Amazon. I appreciate so much all of this tears and laughter and fun. You go out there, you continue to live. I love you. Thank you.